Welcome to Sunday Stories. I'm Michael Sanford. Over the next hour, we'll be sharing stories that celebrate the rich history, amazing people, and fascinating places throughout our region and beyond. Prior to Columbus's arrival, about 300 indigenous languages were spoken in North America. Today, only half of those languages still exist, and many are facing extinction. Scholars predict that by the year 2050, there may be only 20 indigenous languages left. At Eureka High School, members of the Yurok tribe are teaching high school students their native language in an effort to save the spoken word and their heritage. One day that Yurok language will be a living, flourishing language where it's spoken everywhere. I know for sure it's gonna happen. It may not happen in my lifetime, but our language will be back, our ceremonies will be back, and, and once again, we're, we're gonna be whole. Saving the Yurok language, later on Sunday Stories. It's a Wonderful Life is a theme that's woven into the stories of Patrick and Bob and Mulvaney, co-owners of Sacramento's Mulvaney's B&L. Their restaurant is their shared passion. It specializes in handcrafted cuisine and features a menu that changes daily to be in sync with our local growing season. The B&L in the restaurant's name actually stands for Building and Loan, a tribute to the discovery made by Jimmy Stewart in It's a Wonderful Life. Instead of running off to the big city, their future was found investing in their local community. The community here has just been so good to us, right, and, and so supportive. And it just seems for both of us in our nature of, of the many things that we argue about, we've never argued about giving back to the community or supporting our employees. A visit with Bobbin and Patrick Mulvaney later on Sunday Stories. An innovative program at Sacramento State is introducing the violin and cello to younger students through lessons taught by university students. Together, they are learning to master music through the String Project. They get to see music majors, and they get to see us being taught by master teachers how to teach. Um, it's very special because they get the chance to play on the university stage, like in the concert hall at a very, very young age. They get to experience all of this. Lessons learned from the String Project, ahead on Sunday Stories. The statistics are alarming. Every 65 seconds, someone in America develops Alzheimer's disease. While there is currently no cure, programs like Connected Horse that involve therapeutic animals have been shown to reduce stress and improve the quality of life for both the people living with early stage dementia and their care partners. That human-animal bond with horses is, is profound. People come in with these very strong roles of, I'm a care partner, I'm a person that has mild cognitive impairment, and quickly, like within minutes, when they meet the horses, those roles just go away because the horses don't care. We see them just activate their relationship and start their bucket list and do things together. They realize they don't have to take the diagnosis and go in the corner. They really can fight and be per a participant in their own life and, and enjoy life again. Horses helping to build connections later on Sunday Stories. Ceramic artist Ruth Rippon's legacy a look at the good work being done by Pride Industries. A visit to the Small Wonders of Africa exhibit. Honoring the efforts of Mexican Americans during World War II. The Yurok tribe is currently the largest group of Native Americans in the state of California, with more than 5,000 members. However, the tribe recently documented that now there are only 11 fluent Yurok speakers still alive. Through new programs like teaching language classes in local schools, the tribe continues its effort to save the Yurok language from extinction.
You're gonna copycat me three times. We're gonna do this three times, okay? So, may we more? May we more. Moo we more. May we more? Moo we more. <laughs> All right. Scoo yan, scoo yan. Are you queen neck now, James Jinsa? Kicha ha kumaka pulik la wata Eureka High School. Chi way tech pop sell essi chi guri, chi guri ukumoi pon. James Jinsaw is teaching these students an ancient Native American language. It's also his tribe's native language. All the words in Yurok, I think they're so beautiful. Yurok is one of three world languages offered to students at Eureka High School in Humboldt County. It's one of several public schools teaching Yurok in the far northern region of California. Not Perry, but Perry. There's a lot of kids that take Yurok that take it because, just because they're curious and they want to find out what it's all about. Wait, Yun. If I can learn Spanish or German anywhere else, this is the only place I can actually learn Yurok. I took it just out of interest in linguistics, and I really do like how it sounds. It sounds aesthetically nice to me. Other students are learning Yurok for deeper reasons than fulfilling their foreign language requirement. Who's on Nina Pemp? Probably a quarter of the students are actually have Yurok descendancy. So I think it just, you know, part of that trying to find out who they are and, and find out a little bit more about themselves. Uh, Kinnick, mate, which song? Danny is one of those students who is taking the advanced Yurok language class. Mr. Jensa not only teaches the language, but he also teaches the cultures and the stories that come with it. And he has done so much to help this language. When I started learning this language, there was, all my speakers were all in their 90s. I had a couple that were close to 100 years old. There's only 25 fluent speakers in Yurok. The language needs all the help it can get. It is on the brink of becoming extinct. Linguists 25 years ago predicted that the Yurok language was going to be extinct by the year 2010. The last known fully fluent native speaker passed away in 2013. All that remains today are roughly 30 conversationally fluent speakers and only several people who can speak Yurok at a high fluency level with James being one of them. Uh, I think when, when any endangered language um, becomes extinct or loses its last um, speaker, I think that we as humans lose a part of our own humanity. For thousands of years, the Yurok, whose name means downriver people, thrived in dozens of villages along the Klamath River. It was their lifeline, used for transportation, and providing a rich bounty of salmon and other essentials. But the arrival of white settlers and their diseases during the gold rush started the Yurok's decline. Thousands died, and others were sent to boarding schools established by the U.S. government to eradicate the Yurok culture. Children were punished for speaking their native language and forced to learn English. By the early 1900s, only a few Yurok still spoke in their native tongue. It was like an apocalypse. I mean, our whole world changed. It's a lot of deep wounds and it's gonna take time. It's not something that can be fixed in one generation or two generations. I think that all of us are working towards that healing. And um, I think the language plays an important role in that healing process. Now, the public school system is trying to help make up for wrongs committed in the past. I think it's a little ironic that it, part of the reason that the, the Yurok language um, almost became extinct was because of the boarding schools and a, and a school system. But we can use that system and uh, we can use it as a tool to revitalize our language and kind of breathe life back into the language. The public schools are an integral part of the tribe's language restoration program. The long-term goal is for our people to once again be speaking only Yurok as our primary language. Barbara McKillen is with the Yurok Language Restoration Program, established by tribal elders in the 1950s. 
we owe a lot to those elders that had enough foresight to know that we needed to preserve our language. Like James, she too teaches Yurok. She remembers one student in particular in one of her community language classes she was teaching back in the early 2000s. He really applied himself, and I hadn't seen anybody like that. He had flashcards, he would write everything down, he'd go home and practice, he'd come back the next week, you know, ready to learn more and use what he learned. The student was James Jensaw. You know, it's always the goal of a teacher to have students learn more than, than, than you're able to teach him, and he did that. Manechos, Tignamaki. To me, I took on that responsibility, and I don't think of it as a burden. I think of it's somebody has to do it, and I think it was just something that I was chosen to do. Kusanake, I want water. Sustaining and sharing this essential part of an ancient culture with future generations is exactly what Barbara, James, and their students hope is already starting to happen. I'm taking this class because I am Yurok, and my ultimate goal is to keep the language going, to learn it completely so that I can pass it on to younger people too. It is part of my culture, and if I can do anything to help it, I definitely will. The death of a language it goes hand in hand with the death of a culture, and that should be stopped as much as possible. Each year, the number of Yurok speakers grows, and this language restoration program is widely recognized as one of California's most successful. One day that Yurok language will be a, a living, flourishing language where it's spoken everywhere. I know for sure it's going to happen. It may not happen in my lifetime, but our language will be back, our ceremonies will be back, and, and once again, we're, we're going to be whole. All those elders, they're up there at Kuwait, Sinan, and they're looking down, and I think they're really happy. Later, a look at the works and influence of ceramic artist and educator Ruth Rippon. But first, we sit down with Patrick and Bob and Mulvaney, who share the love story behind one of Sacramento's most popular restaurants, Mulvaney's B&L. Co-owner and executive chef Patrick Mulvaney has become a point person on Sacramento's growing farm-to-fork movement. He's a New York City native, but as a lunch rush hits, don't expect any loud outbursts. Patrick is in charge of the kitchen, but his style is more of an understated confidence. He was the smartest chef really I ever it. met. <laughs> smartest chef I ever met, honest to goodness. While Patrick was getting the sound bites and magazine spreads, Bobbin was largely in the background. Not anymore. He asked me to step up to the plate because, you know, he's our lead singer and uh, the popular one. And he says, you are the sexy bass player in the back. You know, you want to step up to the front. Right. So you're gonna go to this you know, it's time. All right. And are there any menu changes right now that you want to talk about? Did you see nope. the final? You're cool yep. with everything? Yep, I think so. The demands of the restaurant make it difficult to get Patrick and Bobbin together here, but when you do, it's a chance to see the quick wit that makes this couple tick. Mmm, there's the big Caesar salad debate of 2011. Well, I, <laughs> I think the biggest challenge of working together is her refusal to acknowledge that I am correct 100% of the time. Both bring their own culinary backgrounds to the business. Bobbin's Northern California catering expertise and Patrick as a chef. Oh, chef, that's hot, baby. That's not bad, though, huh? No. It's got enough oil in it. Needs a little meat, maybe. How they met? 
There's just different, different versions of this story. Well, there's true, true, and Mulvaney true. <laughs> yes, and by the way, the Mulvaney's do not let the truth get in the way of a good story. <laughs> I think the truth of the story is, is I have Robin started stalking me. Yeah, that was it. I noticed when I would refer small events to him that I couldn't do with the large company I was working for, he would send me personal notes back to thank me. I'm like, who does this? He'd call and leave a message, thank you for the referral. I'm like, that, this, I'm impressed. And I'm from old school, right? Where chefs are generally dogs and they, you know, definitely looking for a job that they can, you know, smoke a joint on their way to work and uh, wear their pajamas to work to this. I still wear my pajamas. He does still wear his pajamas to work. Uh, but what he, it was is really smart about food, food. And I am from the valley. I am from where the food has grown up around me. And he came here from New York because he was excited about this food. And it just reignited after nine years of selling commercial catering, box catering, that now I was with someone who was into the Terra. So it was a blessing to me. Then I started stalking him. Hey Patrick, where are these? We're going to uh, 89, so you can take them to the wine room. It's Malcolm and Oh, Pat. the wine room. Come on back. Yeah. The couple opened Mulvaney's B&L in 2005. Two years later, Bobbin was diagnosed with stage three cancer. Patrick had a realization. I don't want to live without this woman. You know, this, she is my life. And um, went home, I was in New York City and, and stopped and asked my mom for uh, my grandmother's Tiffany ring and uh, brought it home, right, had the little box and I came home from my trip. I'd been gone for a couple of days. I said, honey, I'm home. I, I want to talk to you. And she said, leave me alone. I'm tired. I said, no, I, I have something I want to show you. And she said, I don't need another pop top from Yankee Stadium. I'm sure it'll be fine tomorrow. And I said, no, really, you, you should look at this. And then she opened her eyes and saw the, the Tiffany box and the ring inside. That was close. So I did, we did go to bed, and he put his arm around me, and he always says a very similar thing. We truly have a wonderful life. I love you so. I don't want to live without you. Will you marry me? And I opened my eyes, and I saw that beautiful box, and I said, well, of course. And then I hear, <laughs> What I love about Patrick is that he is, he's my man, there's no doubt. I, I did not know how much I was looking for just a man, a big, strong man who was true to himself. Because if he's true to himself, then he's gonna be true to me. God gave him broad shoulders, and I know why. And a broad, broad. <laughs> That's not so nice. <laughs> they can edit it. After more than 10 years in business, the couple maintains a sense of humor, a passion for food, and a belief in doing good in the community. The community here has just been so good to us, right, and, and so supportive. And it just seems for both of us in our nature of, of the many things that we argue about, we've never argued about giving back to the community or supporting our employees. The B&L in the restaurant's name actually stands for Building and Loan, a tribute to the discovery made by Jimmy Stewart in It's a Wonderful Life. Merry Christmas, Emporium! Merry Christmas, you wonderful old building and loan! Instead of running off to the big city, their future was found investing in their local community. The restaurant sits in a historic firehouse. We have all kinds of little hiding places here. This is actually my office. This is the China Room. This is amazing. This is uh, where we keep all our catering platters or specialty pieces for our banquets. And the truth of the matter is, you can see it setting up as a dining room right now. Normally, I've got a couple racks right here. And last year, we had sold out house. My husband cannot say no. He promised someone they would have a table. There was no room in the end. So lo and behold, he had the wait staff unpack my china, pull the racks out of here to put a table in here. They, next, they ate in here that night. They ate in here that night. The next week, he did the same thing. The next week, the staff put wheels on the bottom of those carts because now we literally set this every single night. 
the ability for an entrepreneur is the ability to step into the pond and know that there's going to be a stone under there. And also know that if you step into the pond when there isn't a stone in and you fall in, that you just come back to the edge and push yourself out. And you can. You know, we make mistakes every day. And I think the ability to hold on to making mistakes and learning from them and recovering from them and making yourself better is really the key. I have a partner in my life and I have a partner in my business that gives me the comfort that I'm not in all of this by myself and I have a bright, uh, wonderful life ahead of me. Yeah, that's right, I'm wonderful. <laughs>
Ruth was, particularly as an educator, not just a skilled artist, not someone who could just teach her students physically how to do things, but it was how to bring a commitment and joy to the process. The idea for this one, I was taking a sun bath in my backyard, and I just was enjoying the warmth of the sun. I always thought of them as my children, since I had none of my own. I thought that they were my children, my students. I taught what I was taught and uh, hoped that the message got to the students and showed up in their work. Not just like my work, but creating their own style of working. Ruth's legacy as an educator and artist set an example for young artists to just to let them know that they can do their own thing. I think, quite honestly, every piece in the show she did, she did for herself. Um, she was the person she had to please. And then there's always the hope that, yeah, somebody else will be pleased too. But this was fun to do too, the carving, the plaster. I just wanted to express my own thoughts about things. It meant something for me to, to make it, and I was, I was glad it was appreciated enough for someone to want to have it. That's the way I feel. <laughs> I have done enough. <clears throat> I'm old enough and I, it's, it's not easy work, you know. Clay is very dense, very hard, heavy to work with, but I enjoyed every minute of it. Still ahead, Rob Stewart takes us inside the exhibit to learn about the bats at the Sacramento Zoo. The Sacramento State String Project is bringing students of all ages together to teach, learn, and make beautiful music. The String Project is a program in which children typically third through seventh graders, study violin and cello from the beginning with university students. The university students are trained in teaching children by master teachers. Stop. You can't be behind. Because we have world-class string teacher trainers as our master teachers, we're training the children to play the instruments really well and effectively. Growing up as a student, as a music student, I never saw myself in the teacher's shoes. Like, I didn't even want to be in those shoes because I saw how hard it was and I saw how much they had to push me to practice. But it just sort of came and I love teaching. Here, there's like 15 kids and you have to grab their attention, all of them. And you're standing in front of them, you have to teach all of them. And it's hard because it's not a student ratio of one to one, it's a student teacher ratio of like 15 to one. I'm professor of cello and chamber music here at Cal State Sacramento School of Music, and I am the founder and the director of the String Project. There is nationwide a severe shortage of teachers, and that's what started the String Project movement. What we're finding is the students, the university students who've had String Project training, all are getting full-time jobs teaching, multiple offers. The Cal State Sacramento String Project is part of a national consortium of string projects. There are about 35 of these at universities around the U.S. Our program is one of two or three that focuses on offering the opportunity for kids from underserved backgrounds to get lessons. On a personal level, I, I have always felt that the arts are an important thing. In the area that I work, in the Robles School District, which is a very, very high poverty part of the city of Sacramento, um, our student population is over 90% um, free and reduced. That's the federal poverty level. And that 
becomes a characteristic of certain aspects of their lives. Um, one of which is that their parents do not have the resources to take them to musical instrument lessons. And so our school district, I think, over time has learned that we can take responsibility for that. We think it's that important. We offer to pay the registration fees, um, either through district funds or the Education Foundation, for the first two semesters. And then we also have now purchased instruments uh, that the district owns that we can loan to our students at no cost. I actually started in a program pretty similar to this. Coming from a program like this, it's always been rooted in me to do the same, to be able to allow kids to have the same opportunities that I did growing up because I know that a lot of kids don't. And I feel very, very fortunate because everything I got, I got for free. And I know that a lot of people struggle to pay for the cost of music. We typically have um, about 80 children uh, studying in the string project. That's 20 or so from Robla, so that's about uh, a quarter of the children in the program. And the rest come from anywhere and everywhere. My son is Caden, and he's 10, and he's been playing the violin. This is his second year in the string project. Yeah, just a little bit. The other programs that we had found, looked into, were more expensive and more time consuming. And this one kind of fit more into our schedule because you get little breaks throughout the school year. And then it's also more affordable. You just pay one semester fee as opposed to a monthly fee. Our other big seller was it's at a college campus. So not only is my son being exposed and learning how to play the violin, but he's being exposed to college and what a college campus looks like and what it feels like and he can feel comfortable when he's here. It's cool because I might go here one day and um, it's cool to see lots of other kids. They get to see music majors and they get to see us being taught by master teachers how to teach. Um, it's very special because they get the chance to play on the university stage, like in the concert hall at a very, very young age. They get to experience all of this. For their parents, their aunts, their uncles who come to the concerts, it's often the first time that they've come on a campus and they have a feeling of ownership. It's life-changing for some of these families. There's no way in the world they would have had a chance to have violin or cello or get to know the music of Mozart or Beethoven. And these families are really excited about what it's doing for their children. This is a hint of what we are about to do behind the scenes of the Small Wonders exhibit here with Outreach Coordinator, Laura Kirkendall. Hey, Laura. Hi, good to see you again. Thanks for coming back. Yeah, glad to be here. You've been on the show several times now before. You bet, we love it. Inside caution exhibit entrance. This is exciting. It is, that lets all the keepers know that that's not just any door, that's an animal <laughs> door. And there are animals behind, but don't worry, we'll all be nice and safe. Would you like to go in? I would love to go in. All Before right. we go in really quickly, Bats, Bats and birds. And birds are inside. Hornbill, crested kua, small birds, and some guinea fowl. They look like spotted chickens. All right, let's go let's look. Let's go. <laughs> How can you not want to see that? I know, right? All right, the key to the zoo. Oh. And in you go. I'll let you go first. Oh, we are inside the exhibit. <laughs> Laura, look at this. Wow. And I just have to point out that Martin, our videographer, and myself went through a series of inoculations for rabies in case we were to get bitten. And that is just something that is procedure. We'll do anything to get you behind the scenes. <laughs> it's just standard policy. All of us keepers also are rabies vaccinated, even okay. though our fruit bats really aren't at risk for having that. It's just a state policy and we continue with that. And we took part in that. You bet you did. Okay. All right, so we're heading down. Behind is where the bats are. <gasps> there are the bats. Did you see them? Now it's hard to tell, but there's a group of them here in the corner. Oh, there are Lord. 20 of them. Look at them all in there. 
And that's exactly what they do in the wild. In the early morning, they'd all be huddled together for warmth, waiting to maybe go out and grab some fruit when the sun rises. Oh my lord. Okay, and we're we're good. Like we're good. Okay. No, no, they're not attack bats. They're not going to fly at you. They're just oh waiting for gosh. the food rings. Look at one moving. They know that you have the food, and they're pretty excited about that. Oh my goodness. All right. So, so when we hang the rings of the fruit from the roof, they're going to start to come over. And the best part is, I also have some mashed banana, okay. which is their favorite. And they'll come over to you, and you can hand syringe feed them some banana. Martin, do you see this? I just am in shock. May I touch, may I reach out? Unfortunately, they're not really great with being touched, but when you give them the banana filled syringe, then they'll be able to come out for a bit of a closer look. All right, let's do it. Come here, babies. Come here. This is banana. <gasps> Martin, come get in here. You see this? <laughs> you have got to be kidding me. This is an African bat. Get out of here. Oh, now they all want it. This is unbelievable. Hi, babies. I never thought I'd say this, but bats are adorable. Which is one of the things you get to learn at the zoo, Laura. That's true. You know, these animals are both fascinating, interesting, and they have a really cool niche. They're very important animals. One of the things that people don't realize about bats is they are pollinators. They are really, really important by uh, dropping and being very messy. They help pollinate huge swaths of forest. And in fact, the rainforest area where these animals are found in Africa, these animals, these bats, do over 80% of the pollinating in that area. Super important animals to have around. Pollinating, see I didn't know And the that. bats that we have here in Sacramento are insect eating bats. And we know what that means. Yeah. All those mosquitoes are getting gobbled up overnight, which we as people love. Look at their cute little tongues. Hi little baby. And that allows them to gather up all the fruit that they find out in the wild. And their teeth help them rip open the ah. thick pieces. Sorry. <laughs> They're just fighting amongst themselves. Okay. One had to tell the other neighbor that it uh, wanted more of the banana. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Okay. Wow. The neat thing about this exhibit is it's a multi-species exhibit, and it accurately represents the animals that you'd find living throughout Africa, primarily in the eastern side. So we have an aardvark living with our fennec foxes, and we have a variety of birds living with our bats, exactly how it would be in Africa. Later, from the vault, Central Valley Chronicles host Betty Vasquez introduces us to Pride Industries. But first, over 6 million people in America are living with dementia. And more than 16 million Americans provide unpaid care for people with the disease. The Connected Horse Project is creating positive, shared experiences for people living with early stage dementia and their care partners by harnessing the therapeutic effects of the human-animal connection. I think about um, the galloping. I mean, life is like that, you know, up and down, riding around, fast, slow. It's just a lot of movement, but that's how I associate a horse. We want to help the person with the diagnosis, but we also want to help the person who's their care partner on this journey. Most of the research is done separated, the two, and we wanted to bring them together. As a caregiver, you have a challenge to balance your life between the needs of those that you're caring for, yourself, and for me personally, I'm working. So coming to the program, what I get from it is the chance to let everything just go to the side and to be here and have an experience with my dad. There's the whole body of knowledge about how horses and humans work together. So the Connected Horse Project has taken that knowledge of horses working in a therapeutic way with children or with um, trauma or with disabilities and has taken it into the research to say, how can we do this with the population that we're serving? The ability to connect with my husband like I hadn't been able to do before. Um, learned a lot more about compassion 
and acceptance of his disease. Uh, and it was something that we could do together because cognitively he was, he was declining and this was something that we could do together and it was just a really good experience. There are over six million people in the United States affected with Alzheimer's disease, so it's a really big problem. And as yet, we really don't have a good treatment. You know, the, the disease really impacts the roles that each of um, the people play and impacts their relationships. And so I think a, a part of the goal of the program is to kind of facilitate that communication. Most of them have been donated for various reasons, lameness, things that make them unsuitable for performance, and then we actually take them as teaching horses. What's amazing to me is the volumes that you can learn from horses, and they don't speak our language. The really cool thing about horses is there is this interaction that you have with them. They read people. They have this amazing ability to, to know if you're nervous or if you're confident or where you stand, and they reflect that. They're really social animals, and that human-animal bond with horses is, is profound. People come in with these very strong roles of, I'm a care partner, I'm a person that has mild cognitive impairment, and quickly, like within minutes, when they meet the horses, those roles just go away because the horses don't care. We see them just activate their relationship and start their bucket list and do things together. They realize they don't have to take the diagnosis and go in the corner. They really can fight and be per a participant in their own life and, and enjoy life again. I feel like I, I want to always share it with others who are being impacted by situations that they can't handle. I, I, I want to make sure that they know that you're not alone and that there's hope, there's help, and this program helps you to put you in that state of mind. We have some wonderful memories that I'll always cherish. <laughs> And welcome to Central Valley Chronicles. I'm Betty Vasquez. In this special edition, I'm delighted to bring you stories about some of our favorite people, people who inspire and move us, give us new ideas and information, make us laugh, or just give us a renewed appreciation for life here in the Central Valley. In short, our local heroes. Today, I'm at Pride Industries with Mike Ziegler. Now, Mike is the president, CEO, and driving force here at Pride, one of Sacramento's largest and fastest growing companies, a company that's doing well by doing good. Mike Ziegler, thank you for letting us invade your space. Betty, you know what? We love to have you here. It's a pleasure to meet you. Uh, I get to meet Betty Vasquez. <laughs> thank you so much. Well, you know, our Jennifer Fisher visited Pride a while back, and she filed this report about you and your marvelous company. Pam Hoskins vividly recalls her first day at Pride Industries. It was a day that would change the rest of her life. And I walk in the door and I realize I wasn't in a normal environment. What she walked into was a very special company, a manufacturing firm that takes care of the little things clients don't want to deal with, while giving jobs to people that society doesn't always know how to employ. I didn't know it was a company who hired people with disabilities. And so it took me back and, it, and uh, from that day I thought, oh, I don't know if this is gonna work for me. And it's 14 years later and I, would not, I wouldn't trade this for anything. So what drives this dedication? Well, it's a simple mission statement employees embrace. Create jobs for people with disabilities. Uh, this is a company that started in the basement of a church uh, by a group of parents of young adults with developmental disabilities. And all they wanted for, was a, for the kids was what we take for granted. They want their kids to be able to earn a paycheck. We have a saying of pride, no money, no mission. We have to make money. We do have to make money because you want to pay people, you need good equipment. But the fact of the matter is what people who thrive at Pride are here because we get to help other people succeed. And think about that. And as you can tell, everyone here shares in his sense of purpose, essentially his sense of pride. I can't say enough good things about Mike. He's the man. He's got this where we are. He knows, you know, surrounded himself with a lot of good people. And uh, here we are. I have to say it's a great place to work and 
Hope you guys find it in your hearts to come and try it out. More than half of Pride's 4,000 employees have some sort of disability. It's Sacramento's 20th largest employer and one of the fastest growing. And Michael, I understand it is the largest employer of people with disabilities in the whole country. And isn't that cool? That is so cool. That yeah. is wonderful. So, so I get to come to work every day right. at a company that when we succeed, somebody with a disability gets a job. Is there anything new or different since we first aired that story? We do a lot of work with the military. So for, with our federal government, uh -huh. and we just opened up, we're, we've taken over uh, running five commissaries, uh, which are giant grocery stores, wow. on the East Coast. So this concept, this wonderful concept, not only grew in California, but across the United States. Throughout the country. Thank you so much, You're Mike. Welcome. In our segment, Excerpt From, we share a part of a longer story with you here, and then you can view the entire story later on our website or on the free PBS video app. Today's excerpt from story, Valentia, examines the experiences of Mexican Americans during the Second World War through interviews with veterans of all branches of our armed forces. She's one of America's longest serving and most distinguished fighting ships. Sailing through war and peace for some 47 years. Now she's in retirement as a floating museum here on San Diego's waterfront. Welcome aboard the USS Midway. I'm Richard Inigas. You may recognize me from roles I've played in movies and on TV. But the role I'm most proud of is my service on board the Navy aircraft carrier Yorktown during the Vietnam War. I'm also the proud son of Navy veteran Rudy Inigas and Army veteran Santiago Carrillo. My parents, along with thousands of other Mexican Americans, answered this country's call during World War II. These were people often neglected in pre-war America, men and women who helped save this country, and in many ways found a better life in post-war America. This is their story. A story of dedication, sacrifice, patriotism, and valor. Valentia, Mexican Americans in World War II. coming out of church, this church here, when I heard about it, and it didn't actually sink in. Being farm boys, we, where the heck is uh, Pearl Harbor? My mother thought I was too young. Uh, and my father said, he's 18. Uh, he's a citizen, that's his duty. And I never thought otherwise that I wouldn't go or that I shouldn't go. They were often relegated to Mexican loaning neighborhoods, schools, theaters, churches. Yet hundreds of thousands of Mexican Americans signed up to serve in World War II. If you look at the statistics, you would have to conclude that that 375 to half a million estimate out of a 2.69 million population is extraordinarily high and remember that you also have Mexican American women serving in the armed forces as well as Mexican nationals. I had friends from Connecticut, Arkansas, California, Arizona, just all over the state. I felt like I belonged to this family. Families with names like Correa and Ramirez sent all of their sons and even their daughters to join the Army, Navy, Marine Corps, and the Air Corps, or do their part here on the home front, giving so much, even their lives for this country. For many, the armed forces turned out to be a great equalizer, and as you will see, gave returning veterans the courage off the battlefield to fight for equal opportunity. I was the only officer. I was the only pilot in the whole group who was Mexican-American. 
the whole group consisted of four squadrons, 64 airplanes, 64 crews. After more than 60 years, Gilbert Duran Orantia still fits into his flight jacket. When World War II broke out, he was an Arizona college student, but he temporarily dropped out to join the Army Air Corps. I just went in because I thought that was the best thing for me and for the Army. They needed people who had two years of college, and I needed to be in some place that would challenge me rather than, be, uh, than carry a rifle, say, across Germany or wherever. The young cadet flew a twin-engine bomber. It was noisy, but I'm telling you, the very first mission I went on, they blew off a, wind, uh, a wingtip. And I thought, how is this thing going to get back? Well, it did great. While discrimination in the armed forces was uncommon, it reared its ugly head on occasion, like the time Lieutenant Orantia was asked to work with a young man named Ramirez. So he reported to me and he became my radio gunner because the other pilots didn't want him. They didn't want him because he was Hispanic. Hispanics were supposed not supposed to be that intelligent. Well, and, and the same thing happened with my crew chief. Nobody would take him because his name was Torres. He was the best crew chief we had. Another Air Corps volunteer, Joe Hernandez from San Antonio, landed in a job not for the faint of heart as a turret gunner flying bombing missions over Germany. Another really bad experience it happened to me on a Friday the 13th. One of our airplanes came right up in front of us in the prop wash, you know, they prepared flipped us over. We fell down about 5,000 feet. We were about at 20,000 at that time. We went down to about 14, 15,000. When it finally the plane, the pilot and co-pilot finally pulled it out. As part of the famed 82nd Airborne Division, Daniel Ramirez worked on board C-47s, planes that towed gliders across the English Channel during the harrowing D-Day invasion. They had 35 paratroopers inside one of the gliders. There's how many, and some of them, some of them guys never get, get out. They, they went in and, and they shot them before they even hit the ground. D-Day, June 6, 1944, marked the Allied invasion of Europe, and John Luna from Ceres, California, was there. When I went first in, <laughs> that was bad, that was very bad. I saw my buddies fall to the side of me. I tried to help them. They had blood all over. I just couldn't help that. The seas were real heavy, and we were, some of our tanks just went to the bottom and then come up. So, but we, man we managed to make it to shore, and we, it was real crowded. We couldn't get out. It was, we were closed in there for several weeks. And we were bombarded day and night, and, and people were dying all around me. All I did was pray and fall on the ground, that's all. And it was my, my, it was my turn. Then I wanted to pay tribute to the different divisions that had fought throughout America's wars. Ernesto Pedregon Martinez is an artist who honors the armed forces on canvas. During World War II, his unit liberated the Nazi concentration camp at Nordhausen. We were struggling to, to tear down the gate. And uh, from afar, we, in the barracks, we started seeing like a little black uh, cloud moving, you know. And uh, we almost opened up on them, you know, because we thought they were soldiers. And uh, as they came closer, it started getting clear that they were people, you know. And uh, we thought that it was an insane asylum because a lot of them were almost completely nude. Eventually, uh, I think we liberated about 5,000 prisoners alive. How did these young soldiers, most of whom had never been far from home and family, deal with the carnage, the danger, the loneliness? Every night that we were in our camp or in our foxhole, I always said my rosary. Faith and friendship. Two pillars of strength among GIs like Joe Arambula from San Antonio. I said my rosary simply because I asked God to watch over me. And secondly, it kept me awake. Awake in the foxhole, he shared with Amos, his buddy from Missouri. 
He is a fine man, just like a brother to me. Joe had already lost two of his brothers in battle. Then Amos died when the truck he and Joe were riding in rolled over. His widow wrote to me after he got killed. And uh, it, it, I, I, I took it pretty hard because he was, we took, we looked after each other. Even as the truck rolled over, he grabbed me. He grabbed me. Then, well, after the first roll, I, I got knocked out. I don't even remember. But uh, that's where he got killed. It was rough. It's, uh, LSD I was on. It was uh, number 13. And to, the, to this day, I'll always believe 13 is a bad number. Because it uh, seemed like we never missed a, a storm out in the Pacific. What was so scary when we first went aboard the USS Saranac, our captain's name was John J. Cross. And the first thing he told us, if you boys are scared to die, you don't belong on this ship. <laughs> to watch the full story, go to kvie.org slash Sunday Stories or download the free PBS video app. I'm Michael Sanford. It's been a pleasure being part of your Sunday. We hope you've enjoyed today's stories and that you'll be back next week for another episode of Sunday Stories. Until then, have a great week.